Hi, this is Eric Prostowski, and we're here with the EP on EP show. And I'm delighted to have a good friend of mine for years and a, an enormous contributor to the field of electrophysiology, Hugh Hawkins. Hugh, welcome to the show. Well, Eric, thank you for inviting me to be on the, this uh, distinguished show. It's a wonderful well, opportunity. I appreciate it. So we're going to get into one of your areas of great intense research, clinical abilities, and it's not tilt table testing. I know you'd like to forget that paper of chronic fatigue. So we're not talking <laughs> chronic fatigue, Hugh. So let's talk about arrhythmogenic right ventricular uh, uh, cardiomyopathies. Starting right off the bat, I I'm a simple clinician, right? I'm at the bedside. I don't have my calculator with me to score it out. I know you have that for research purposes, but tell me in the audience, how do we arrive at just a routine clinical diagnosis without going through a big scoring sheet? Well, Eric, as you know, it's a rare disease, one in 5,000. It's also a potentially life-threatening disease, so you don't want to miss the diagnosis if the patient presents to you. So I'll give you two scenarios. The first scenario is the typical patient with uh, RVOT PVCs that shows up in your office. You know, normal EKG, healthy kid, left bundle inferior axis VT or non-sustained VT. You know, yes, get an echo, yes, get an EKG, but this is not ARVD, this is common things are common, you know, do your ablation, get the PVCs gone, and there's no need to be doing MRIs or genetic testing in someone like that with a normal baseline EKG and the typical left bundle inferior axis PVCs. Now, in distinction, picture a 19-year-old young person showing up who's a superstar athlete who's just had abrupt onset syncope and you're sitting there looking at his EKG and there's, there's T-wave inversions V1 to V3, there's a left bundle superior axis PVC, you know, the light bulb needs to go off. This is not idiopathic benign nothing PVCs. This is something potentially dangerous. This is ARVD. And in fact, you can virtually make the diagnosis just based on the EKG and the history and the clinical context. So you've made the diagnosis, then you confirm it and get this kid treated. Well, that's, that's what I was trying to get. There's some practical points that are not research. So let's take that kid just for a second and, and follow him through a little bit. Um, my experience with ECHO is it's plus minus. Uh, MRI, next step for you and somebody like that? I mean, certainly if you have a center that can do good quality MRIs and interpret them appropriately, that's the best diagnostic test for patient number two, not patient number one where right. you don't need high sensitivity. Patient number two, certainly an MRI is the best imaging modality for possible ARVD or ARVC, but you also need to know there's lots of piss pitfalls in diagnosis, and the most common reason for misdiagnosis is an in, in inaccurately interpreted MRI. And in fact, you've written on that. I, I actually remember a paper, I think maybe you did it with Frank Marcus, or I can't remember who was involved, where there was gross overdiagnosis. It was, isn't that true? I mean, it's, they're overread sometimes. Yes, I mean, one of our first papers in the field was on misdiagnosis of ARVC. Right. We described why all these patients were inappropriately diagnosed, and the MRI was the most common reason. And you also are nice enough to publish a paper of ours that I think is very important on this topic. And when Frank wrote his classic paper in 1982, well, Frank Marcus, Frank for those Marcus, who, who don't know, and the late Guy Fontaine, who just right. passed away two days ago, in that paper, it was a wonderful paper, and he had a concept of the triangle of dysplasia, where he said the triangle is the inflow tract, the outflow tract, and the apex of the right ventricle. And then we wrote a paper, which you were nice enough to publish in your journal about the triangle of dysplasia displaced, I think was the title. Something like that, right? It was a little, a little the, twist on it. But yes. the point is very important, is that the apex, the RV apex, is never involved with early ARVD. It's only involved when the entire RV is wiped out and that's the last you know, myocyte to go. So in the past, people would look at an MRI, say, oh, that apex isn't moving much. Oh, it looks thin. You know, this must be ARVD. Wrong again, ARVD doesn't involve the apex. Thinning is not a criteria for ARVD. Anyhow, so it's really the inflow tract, the outflow tract, and the posterior lateral LV is what we- Right, I remember right. the paper. In fact, I remember reading, reading that as I was going through it with uh, the editorial process. I seem to remember there was a fair amount of emphasis that it might be earliest in the posterior area. And if I'm remembering it right, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was something you guys brought in out. In the posterior lateral LV, when you do an MRI, that's the other area that's typically involved other than right below the tricuspid valve, the outflow tract, and then it's the posterior lateral LV. In many patients with ARVD, even though we call it 
ARVD, it's mainly a right-sided disease, left involvement can occur, and when it occurs, it oftentimes is the posterior lateral LV. So let's, again, follow through. So now you've made the diagnosis. And this one, syncope, you know, you kind of know where you're headed. Uh, so defibrillate, I mean, first of all, let's talk genetic testing. You, do you recommend genetic testing, yes or no, in, 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 when you get to that point? Yeah, certainly once you have a proband, a first diagnosed patient, the main thing is to start with the diagnosis in the patient in front of you. Right. Is that if that patient either meets the diagnosis or it's strongly suggestive, you should get genetic testing and it's important to have a genetic counselor and expert help you interpret those results because it can be very complex. But in about two thirds of patients, you'll, you can find a, a pathogenic mutation. Two thirds, that's interesting. I, I thought it was lower, so teach me on something on that. I thought it was in the 25 to 30% range. Is it, it's now up to two thirds who have a positivity? Yes, when you have well phenotyped patients, so in the patients that we see at Hopkins, you know, it's two thirds you can find a pathogenic wow. mutation. And we had a paper on, uh, I think it was six or 700 patients with ARVD, you know, between us and Richard Howard's group in the Netherlands, and in 67% you found a mutation. 67, okay. Most likely, placophilin 2 is the most common variant we see in the U.S. and in the Netherlands. So, um, are there any um, treatment issues with, depending on what kind of variant you find, uh, or is it just making a diagnosis? In other words, if you subtyped it up to this point to yeah. say, this person uh, is more malignant than this, or is it, we haven't gotten to that point? Well, what we have found is if you have multiple mutations in one gene or mutations in two different genes, that's a worse outcome kind of a patient, so, so that's important. And then there's also certain mutations that do particularly poorly, desmoplakin mutations, mainly left-sided disease, they seem to do worse. The reonidine receptor uh, mutation, TMEM43, the group in Newt Newfoundland, that's a highly penetrant, sort of mainly in Canada only disease, but it's extraordinarily lethal. So yes, there, you know, the specific genetic findings can help a little bit with your therapy, and also where, you know, if you have a PKP2, you know, this is the sweet spot. This is where we have lots of experience, lots of evidence about all the recommendations of how to manage these patients. So we're getting to management now. This has been great. So now we have this patient of yours that had syncope. Do you need to do an EP study to prove there's VT? Are you okay just putting in an ICD? What's your next step? Well, you gotta, I mean, you, you know, even though you don't like the scoring system, you'd have to do a complete evaluation. Complete evaluation is a 12 lead EKG, an MRI, you know, and a Holter monitor and genetic testing when indicated. Right, so, so let me stop you here because you're right, I don't like the scoring system. So you have T waves inverted, V1 through V3, you have syncope, you have a large RV, and um, okay, and you have a positive gene. I'm, I need to go add things up or am I okay? No, 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 I mean, all you need to make the diagnosis is, you know, two, bear with me, two major <laughs> criteria or one major, two minor, meaning, T-wave inversions, V1 to V3 is a major. That gets you one half right. of the diagnosis. And severe RV disease is another major, gets you two, and then you've made it. You don't even have to count any higher. Well, I'm teasing you. But, but, you know, no, but, but, but anyhow, but it's, yes. it's about, so you want to do the complete evaluation. One okay. test that we no longer do is the signal average EKG. Right. Even though it's one of the criteria, we found it's very poor sensitivity and specificity, so we no longer do that. And, I, and, I, and, and anyhow, so that's one no, test we've so gotten rid of. I, I'm delighted because I don't even know my, where my machine is anymore. So I'm delighted you got rid of it. Remember we wrote boards? I mean, that was always put one board question on that, but none of us have the machine anymore. Yeah. So, so, but you have syncope that's not vasovagal. I mean, it's a real hardcore syncope. You're an EP, you say this sounds arrhythmic. You got all the other anatomic features. You made the diagnosis. I mean, I'm thinking I need to put a defibrillator, but is it recommended that you take him to the lab and do an EP study first, or can you just, at that point, go put a defibrillator? Yeah, so I mean, you're right in your, your, your thinking as the, the ultimate clinician. You make the diagnosis first, and then the next question is, is this patient's risk of sudden death high enough to warrant a defibrillator, or what do you have to do to, to convince yourself it is? In my, what we've learned about ARVD is probands are at much higher risk than family members. So this young man is the proband, the first one in the family right. diagnosed, so that's higher risk. We also know that young men do worse in terms of sudden death risk. So you're, you know, because testosterone plays a role, there's a lot of data now on, on men doing worse. So you have a young guy, you know, you know, and then we also know that syncope is, you know, certainly recent onset syncope that's cardiac in description 
is a, is a strong predictor of a poor outcome. So basically, you meet diagnostic criteria, you're the proband, you have some other high-risk marker, could be syncope, or could be a Holter with 5,000 PVCs or runs a non-sustained VT, that's someone you need to put a defibrillator in. And no, you don't have to do an EP study before, you always, you've already risk stratified, put in a defibrillator, and then we can discuss the issue about, you know, you, you know when you put a defibrillator, what type do you put in? So, this has been fabulous, wealth of data. I'm going to go to a little more of a gray zone now because I would love to get your perspective on it. And I know clinicians out there are probably wondering about this whole exercise issue that's come up in l recent literature. So let's take the proban first of all. He was a high-level athlete, let's say, he, like you said, he came to you, and now he has an ICD. Do you bench him, tell him he can't do competitive sports? Yes, we strongly, I mean, one, patients are free to do what they want. They just have to be informed of the potential consequences. And the evidence linking ARVD and, and, and exercise in ARVD is un, it's, in, you know, it's very, very strong from all over the world. It's very clear that if you have ARVD and if you continue to exercise at a high level, progression is faster, you're more likely to have VT, you're more likely to get heart failure, you're more likely to need a transplant. So that kid would, you, you know, I would strongly advise him not to you put the defibrillator in, but the message he should be told is you need to stop the exercise. You know, walking and golf are fine, but no more swimming, no more whatever. You know, if he chooses to do that against your best considered opinion, obviously everyone's free to live their own life, but once he has a few more shocks, I think he'll, he'll, he'll you know, tone get it down. Get the message? Yeah, he'll get the <laughs> message. Okay, I'm gonna make it a little tougher on you now. So that's your pro ban, 14 years old, up and rising star, you know, everyone's looking at him for ACC uh, tournament type of a player, you know. Now you go to his brother who's 16 years old, is already playing high level basketball, and you advise family get tested, and he comes in and he gets a positive genetic test. You do a complete evaluation, Hugh. You're convinced there's no phenotypic uh, uh, demonstration of disease. He's already a high level player. Do you tell him to stop? Well, what you do is you inform him of the of the of the potential opportunities. I mean, if he is, to, I mean, generally we would recommend that they give up elite or competitive athletics, and we say if you give that up, your risk of developing the disease is dramatically reduced. You may never get it, and the intensity of follow up and monitoring and risk you're accepting is much smaller. I mean, some patients will say. Thank you for the, the information, but I don't have the disease now. I really want to exercise. And then we'll develop a more aggressive monitoring scheme for those patients. If they continue to play sports, we'll say twice a year we want to get 24-hour Holter monitors. Twice a year we want to get an EKG. And we may get annual MRIs. And if you, I mean, one of the things that's, that's nice in ARVD is everyone's sort of afraid of that patient with almost no evidence of disease who drops dead and has two myocytes affected. Basically, that never happens. I won't say never, but in right. the real world, you never see that. You know, the risk of an arrhythmia is related to the, 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 the extent of electrical involvement of the a evidence of ARVC, the extent of structural involvement, and then modified a little bit by gender and exercise and age. So, so in this person with no evidence of disease, yes, there are a young man who's gene positive who's going to be exercising, all of which are risks. But if, you know, but if you put in this monitoring scheme, I think that's a reasonable other right. option, but I don't think this is someone that should count on a, pl a career in professional, professional basketball. They right. should either hang it up after high school or hang it up after college because if they keep going, it's not that everyone who exercises at a high level gets it. We've looked at this, but about 50% of patients who exercise at an elite level will get it, you know, but that 50% could present with sudden death. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a real problem. Hugh, what a fantastic overview of a difficult area with, uh, that you've been so involved in. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Eric.